Hi, I'm Kelly Gardner. And I'm Adele Walsh. And we're Unladylike. Vivian Gornick grew up in the Bronx and began her writing career as a journalist with The Village Voice in 1969. She became an early chronicler of the feminist movement and later moved into writing criticism for The Voice and The Nation. Her books include biographies of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Emma Goldman, a guide to writing personal narrative called The Situation and the Story, and two collections of essays, Approaching Eye Level and The End of the Novel of Love. But she is probably best known for her books of memoir, which include fierce attachments about her childhood and her difficult relationship with her mother, and the recent The Odd Woman in the City. Sean Pryor is a writer and broadcaster working in radio, television, print and online, specialising in reporting on the arts and popular culture. She's been a newspaper columnist, a travel and opinion writer and a theatre, opera and book critic, most recently a presenter on ABC Classic FM. She's also a musician and a recording artist and a producer of concerts in venues ranging from churches and concert halls to building sites and bars. Shan writes fiction and non-fiction, teaches writing, and last year completed her PhD in creative writing. Her first book, Shy, a memoir, was published in 2014. Let's start with the work of writing memoir. Um, Vivian, you've written about the difference between the situation and the story. Can you tell us a bit about how you think those things work in memoir? Yes, I can. (laughs) Um, I don't know when this came to me. It's just a set of terms. uh, It it was just a new way of actually framing very old knowledge. And and that is what occurred to me was that that when you set out to write something, say, about childhood or say... um, well, anything. It's just, it's raw material. If I set out to write about my childhood, for instance, that's the raw material of my life. I consider that a situation. Or if I take a boat trip and something terrible happens and my life has changed, that is a situation. In literature, you make a situation make large sense of things. You you want to make it reach metaphoric dimensions. That is what I call the story. So that, in other words, I'm using the the raw material uh, of my childhood to say something larger than that, to um, to fulfill or dramatize or um, some emotional insight, something that the that the reader can take away. The reader is not interested in my life. The reader is only interested in what I make of my life. So that I have to work to make that life say something to the disinterested reader. I'm repeating myself. But that is what I mean by the situation of the story. And once those terms occurred to me, they became an organizing principle for me to think about this kind of work, about um, what I came to call personal narrative. It's it's a better term for me than uh, than memoir because... I use storytelling techniques to tell, to, to write about, I, I don't make anything up ever, but I do compose. It's, I, this is not a uh, sheet of confessional writing. I'm not in, a, in an analyst's office. I, this is not a police blotter. I'm not, I'm not just giving you the facts. The, I am giving you a, com- a composition. I'm giving you a story that has a narrative arc, and I sacrifice often literalness to the achievement of that narrative arc, which everybody does. And when readers don't understand this, when they accuse us of not telling the absolute, the factual truth, there are often times when those readers are at fault, not the writers. When the reader needs to be more educated to this kind of writing, um, I do believe that firmly. And it's still, it's still a problem. <laughs> so how, do, how does the situation in the story operate in The Odd Woman in the City? The Odd Woman in the City is made up of three strands, three elements. Uh, one is friendship, a particular friendship that I have with a man I call Leonard. Uh, another is my encounters on the streets of the city of New York. And a third is 
my attempt to account for myself, how I came to be the odd woman, the woman that I, that I am. I tried to, from two different angles to write this story once upon a time, first through that friendship and then through this, the meditations on myself. Neither one worked. Neither one alone worked. Then finally I hit on the city, which was the glue. The city. Now, what do I mean by that? I didn't know myself. All I knew was that when I hit on the city, everything began to feel larger. I began to feel I was going somewhere. I wasn't even sure myself what I meant by that, but I felt intuitively that the more I intertwined all of these uh, and I, uh, these strands of, of interest, uh, the larger my perspective ca- became. And I do feel in the end that I have produced something that addresses a kind of paradigmatic life, a life that is certainly urban and contemporary. And, right? Didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> you certainly did. I, yeah. So that, that began to be my drama. That became my, uh, the, that, that supplied me with a sense of narrative arc. And then I arranged all of those incidents and chose and arranged them so that they would further my sense of what I was doing. It feels sometimes when you're reading it like a series of vignettes or some yes. uh, um, in- incidents that are grouped around a, a smaller idea, mm-hmm. perhaps a day when no, you could, misconnected with people, you didn't connect with people, right. and people started shouting random things at you or uh-huh. something like that. <laughs> but it always feels like that there is a narrative arc and then towards the end Good. it comes together. Yes. Yeah. I worked very hard on that. <laughs> I bet you did. Yeah, I rearranged that about 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> all that stuff. And in the end, all you really have is your intuition uh, to tell you. Or then the, then the editor tells you and then the readers tell you that you you sort of done it right, yeah. I, I do feel I worked hard to get this right and that you always work hard to get it right, and this time I did. <laughs> that doesn't sound immodest. <laughs> I think you're allowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Sean, I've heard you talk about this as yes. well and how you applied the idea of the situation and the story to your memoir. Uh, Vivian's hmm. Vivian's theory about the situation and the story was introduced to me by a writing mentor and it came at absolutely the right moment for me in the construction of my memoir. Hmm. And it, But it came to me in a slightly brutal way in that he sat me down one day and he said, so what's this book about? And I said, oh, you know, it's about shyness and me. And he said, well... I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He yeah. said, well, I don't really know you, so why should I be interested? And I'm not shy, so why should I be interested? And he forced me to keep asking myself, what is the story I'm trying to tell from this situation of being a person who is shy, over and over again? And it was a fantastic exercise, and one which yes. I now use in my teaching you a good turn. all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, because what I was able to eventually say in answer to that question of what is the story you're trying to tell from this situation was, okay, it's a story about fear and Mm -hmm. it's a story about loneliness and it's a story about fear of loneliness and it's a story about um, coming to terms with the knowledge that you're never going to be the person who you think you wanted to be (laughs) and accepting the person who you are and acknowledging the positives of the person who you are that come with the temperament trait that you have. And as you described Sounds before, like, yeah. that, that's, that's yeah. the process by which ideally you make the themes of your very personal story universal. Right. Who of us has not experienced fear? Of course. Who of us has not experienced loneliness? Absolutely. Who of us has not aspired to be something or someone that we're never going to be or that we have, you know, failed. Right. Or we feel like we've failed to be. Right. So, um, and as I said, this is something that I now use in my teaching all the time. I constantly say to my non-fiction students, 
you've got an interesting situation here, potentially, but what is the story <laughs> you want to tell me about this? And I quote your words mm-hmm. from the book. I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, this is my holy Bible. Mm-hmm. It virtually yeah. is. <laughs> but Vivian says, the, the insight, the wisdom, the thing you have come to say. What yeah. is the thing you have come to say? Right. Because without that, who cares? That's lovely. I'm really <laughs> proud. <laughs> that was a wonderful story. So both of you write in different ways about the self in relation to others, sometimes specific people like your mother, but more often about that narrated self finding a way to be in the world. Mm -hmm. And Vivian, in in, um, the situation in the story, you suggest that the writer must find the other in themselves to create that sense of movement in the narrative. And I'm fascinated by this idea that you have of defining yourself as an odd woman. Oh. Where did that come from? Oh, that comes from um, George Gissing. Um, George Gissing was a great 19th century English Victorian novelist. Um, now, back up a little bit. Um, the women's movement, the, the, the women's movement, began in the French Revolution with Mary Wollstonecraft and the vindication of the rights of women. And then every 50 years, for the next 200 years, it raises its ugly little head and makes a little progress. Each time around, feminists are called something else. The new women, the liberated women, the free women. But Gissing, I think, nailed it. He called us the odd women. (laughs) By which he meant, and, and that's the name of a, a great novel of his, which I used to read every six months for years, uh, by which he meant he was talking about those women who could not make their peace with the world as it is. And we, as feminists of the second wave of Americans uh, in the 70s and 80s, I felt I recognized my generation in that novel, and that's why I read it so many times. Um, I just felt he he nailed us. He he just got it completely right. That book is about the gap between what I what he called practice and theory. Uh, in other words, we declared ourselves as feminists, and we said, you know, no more this, no more that, and uh, I'll do without, and uh, you know, so no more children, no more husbands. <laughs> No more this, no more that. And then we discovered, of course, the obvious, that our feelings were a lot more complicated than that. And you couldn't live either way. Uh, So I thought that we were falling into the gap between practice and theory and had to struggle up out of it. And what was wonderful about his book is he shows, he shows us all, the new man and the new woman, in all our frailty and all our inability to make live what for us to live out what we declare ourselves to be, so in both in the in that novel he has a man and a woman who want to be the new man and the new woman, and they fail miserably, uh, and it's thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> so I I always thought of myself as the odd woman after that, <laughs> and I love that story of um, you being. Um, a journalist at the Village Voice, mm. and someone says to you, the editor says to you, there are these chicks meeting over in Bleecker Street. Right. <laughs> They're calling themselves women liber- Women's, women's Liberation yeah. or something like that. Can you go over and check it out? And then a week later, there I converted. Am. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Those were thrilling times. Uh, it, was, it felt as if a thousand women in New York were discovering the same thing at the same time. And it wasn't a thousand, but it was enough. Uh, and I had obviously felt the stirrings of this without knowing, you know, until they named it. And once I began to meet them all, I knew I was one of them. And uh, so then I went home, and I didn't write about them, but I wrote about the history of my own experience and my own feelings. That growing up, me and all my friends, all we did was talk about boys, and all they did was talk about things. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, the, it was a tremendous eye opener. It was the realization that we were living a soap opera, and that we—it was just amazing, really, when you think about it. And it's—it's—it's it, it's, it's such a mystery why a moment comes when many, many people see the same thing at the same time. It's—it's—it's it's, it's age old, but there it was, and um, and that was it. So and you were there, and I was there, right? And you report—you're one of the 
great chronic. I'm yeah. one of the founding mothers, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the other things that you have in common is that you both write about early and sudden deaths of your fathers and, mm. and growing up <clears throat> surrounded by women, I suppose, with, with mothers who are powerful. In Shan's memoir, she interviews her mother, who's a psychologist, psychotherapist. Mm. Um, and, of course, you've written... F- um, Vivian, yeah. You've written was your mother like my mother? <laughs> uh, my mother... My mother was a drama queen. Yeah, no, my mother I- I- is the opposite, actually. She She's a professor of psychology. She's internationally renowned as oh. a, a research psychologist. But you wouldn't meet a more modest mm. woman oh, or a more self-effacing woman woman you know in person uh so she she's just written her own i wouldn't call it a memoir but you know she has written her memories of her life and Mm -hmm. uh it's even for someone who you know has known her for 50 years it's shocking to me to realize what an extraordinary woman she is and what an impact she has had and how strong and brave she's been in so many areas of oh, her life. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, so... A better story than I have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vivian's uh, mother is also internationally renowned, but right. now for different <laughs> reasons. <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wonderful. So you grew up feeling um, properly nourished by this woman, by this mother. I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, but even my mother, it's interesting, even my mother, you know, an internationally renowned temperament psychologist, herself professed to be shocked when she read the first draft of my memoir about the levels of distress that I had felt throughout my life about shyness. She didn't know? She she knew that I was shy. She just didn't know what sort of an impact I felt that it had had on my life and how distressing it had been. And I think that's probably because... Like many shy people, I worked incredibly hard to hide that, to pretend that, you know, everything was fine, right. to hide my social anxiety, even from my own family. Uh, but, right. you know, and so she, she's, it's sad, she sort of actually expressed a bit of remorse now that she didn't perceive all of that. And I have to reassure her and say, you know, I'm fine. It's fine. You did a great job. Nobody knew. Nobody knew how how hard this felt. Now, I don't want this to turn into a pity party, but, you know. (laughs) No, no. Social anxiety is distressing. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very decent of her to feel bad that she wasn't able to help you and that you yeah. lived through this all. Well, but and the other the thing that I, that I talk about in the book is, uh, you know, there's a bit of an empathy feedback loop between my mother and I and, and even between my mother and my sister and I. And, and I think, you know, relating to what you were just saying about women, this is one of the fantastic things about the ways in which women relate at their best is this intense empathy, this intense uh, compassion for each other's situations mm. and... Uh, desire to sort of help each other. I mean, you know, obviously it's not universal and we've all had bad experiences. No, it's not but, universal, uh, but it's, it's a lot more evident now yeah. because of the women's movement who use last 40 years than yeah. ever and women before. are allowed to be kind and gentle in ways that the culture is less encouraging of men to be still. Women are allowed to be kind and gentle. Hmm. I think we've been too kind and too gentle. <laughs> uh, I don't think we've been allowed to. We've been urged to yeah. <laughs> be. Yeah. Well, but I, mean, I don't. I never think in those terms. I, I, uh, um, these characteristics, the, these descriptive terms that we're using, for me, it's all fallout. You know, in other words, um, I concentrate more on the question of achieving equality and then let the chips fall where they may, you know, rather than thinking any more of uh, this is this characteristic as female, this characteristic as male. I, I've stopped thinking about these things in those terms and I simply think about people of, of every sex <laughs> and every gender um, struggling to experience themselves, to have a, as full a life as you can make. Mm-hmm. And then let's see who we are, you know. Um, uh, I do think, uh, at the best, uh, we ha- have made men more liberal, more self-conscious. And if that leads to more compassion and more kindness, if, if, if more men learn to see us simply as fellow sufferers, uh, that's a good deed. Then, then I think that's a great development. I myself feel that 
after I became a very um, self-conscious feminist, I had more uh, sympathy for men than I never had before in my life. I came to see them as fellow sufferers. I came to see them as as trapped in the system as I was. Um, and it is the hope that th- that self-consciousness, that that recognition of what's wrong with your own life is evident in somebody else's life, that, I should hope, would create compassion all around. Mm. And sometimes it does. Not always. And surely there's a role in that change of memoir, of women for the first time, really, in the last century, en masse, being able to write, record, publish the stories of their lives so that other women could read them, men could read them. And before that, really, the idea of the memoir was a very white male yeah yes that's true kind of, that's true right and the form has changed mm-hmm. um, but also who is whose stories are privileged has changed as well yes i would say that and yes. what kinds of stories and what kinds yes. of yeah stories what kinds of stories are of interest right mm. yes we so, used to think that that the elements of, of most women's lives were of no interest to a larger a readership but it's not true it's not true, and it's also the one of the things that both of you have done to take these tiny little, almost incidental moments of a life. Mm-hmm. Um, you you mentioned Virginia Woolf's line, the, the moments of being, the mm. things that, that make your life, that may seem unimportant in a wider context, and arrange them into the story mm-hmm. so that they create greater meaning in your narrative, but also for the readers. Right. Yeah, I mean, one of those that I uh, used in my memoir, and this relates to, to our discussion just now about feminism, was an experience I had of uh, writing an article, writing an opinion piece for the newspapers about our former Prime Minister, uh-huh. Julia Gillard, our right. first female Prime Minister, oh, right. uh, who on national television came out and admitted that she was shy. Oh, really? She was a shy person. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I that wrote... That was a boost? <laughs> well, I wrote an opinion piece using my supposed expertise as a you know, student of political science, so tell, saying why this was a bad thing to do as a politician. Oh, really? Or not a bad thing, but why this was a, not a strategically useful thing to do, to admit as a woman, as the first woman Prime Minister, oh, that, you, that you are right. shy. Well, yeah. And embattled. An embattled abuse. Yes, yes, trolled, yes. Uh, And I was inundated with angry emails from readers of my opinion piece who basically thought that I was attacking, I was yet joining the, the crowd that was attacking her. And my little revelation, you know, speaking of women's memoirs being full of little revelations, was that my own very strong feminism had in at least in part come from my sense that women are stereotyped as the weaker sex my shyness or social anxiety made me feel weak mm-hmm. in order to not be a weak person and in order to be a good feminist i had to fight this thing which i felt weakened me mm-hmm. so you know it just was another layer an creative layer of how identity comes to be formed, you know, yeah. how I came to see myself as a feminist was not unrelated to yeah. seeing myself as a shy person. Right, right. So, yeah, this is the sort of stuff that you probably wouldn't yeah. have, a century ago have heard men living large lives on the public stage talking about in their, no. in their memoirs. You're absolutely right. <laughs> no. Even though they suffer from it just as much as yeah. we do. Charles Darwin, yeah. hello. Yes. Charles Darwin, exactly. shy, wrote yeah, about shyness. Absolutely, China. absolutely. Many, many mm. of them. Your piece raised an interesting question. These women, the people who inundated you with these these hate mails, they're responding to the contemporary culture abroad, which prizes uh, people airing their vulnerabilities. It's it's a mixed bag, believe me, the whole thing. And I think you were right to uh, to to write what you wrote, and I th- and they were compelled mm. to answer as they did. <laughs> I concluded that I had been unsuccessful in actually articulating what I wanted to articulate. Right. I well, had, then I hadn't been subtle enough or, again. or direct <laughs> enough. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, I put it in the book. That's yeah. all I can well, okay. leave it alone now. So did that help you write the book better? I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, it's certainly a, a chapter of experience. the book that people respond to yeah. with great interest, yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. women. Yeah. yeah. 
And that yeah, it's a question tricky business. Does, um, also about the level of vulnerability, the level of truth, and how truth operates in right. the personal narrative. And the yeah. decisions, what decisions did you have to make about how to narrate that emerging sense of self, which is kind of what you're yeah. saying, mm. you know, is how, how we focus now. That well, that's the writing of the book should clarify that. As you write, you, you, that sense of what exactly am I writing about here? What is it I want this story to tell? Should determine what goes into it and what doesn't go into it. Um, how you do that is... When I began to write Fierce Attachments, that, that first memoir about my mother, myself, and a woman who lived next door, uh, I began writing it in the past. I was a little girl growing up in a tenement in the Bronx, working class immigrant um, uh, neighborhood. Uh, and, um, well, my, my mother... My mother was a working class housewife, right? Immigrant, Jewish, all the rest of it, uh, housewife. A woman moved in next door to us who was a Ukrainian peasant. My mother was just this respectable housewife. The woman who lived, moved in next door was ravishingly beautiful. She was a peasant, but she was very beautiful. Her name was Nettie, and she looked like Greta Garbo. So these two women became attached to each other, and um, my mother gave her respectability. She was a, a wreck of a human being. She was married to a um, merchant marine, and when I was about, I don't know, 12, 12 years old, they each lost their husbands. My father died, and her husband got killed in a bar, barroom brawl on the other side of the world. So they became attached to each other. So Nettie was glamorous, and my, she gave my mother sex. My mother gave her respectability, right? And between them, I thought they were making this woman. And they were pulling me apart. One wanted me to be intellectual, and one wanted me to be beautiful and sexually successful. So for a long time, I thought that was the book I was writing. A long time. Eight months, I wrote like that. And then I realized I had a lot of unfinished business with my mother, and I couldn't fit it into this tale of the past. And then I stumbled on my mother and I walking, taking walks together. And in these walks, I let her be everything that she was not in the past. In the past, she was a self-pitying, <laughs> utterly self-absorbed, depressed she was the absolute opposite of everything you've described. You know, a woman who was just like sucking up the oxygen of the house, killing us all. Uh, Nettie, on the other hand, became the whore of Babylon. She, <laughs> she fucked everything that moved. <laughs> <laughs> and right, so here they, they both were. And here was I struggling between them. But in fact, as we walked and talked and more and more walks accumulated... I began to see her differently, and I began to see myself differently. And then I realized that was not what I was writing about. What I was writing about was that I couldn't leave my mother because I had become my mother. <laughs> In other words, I had internalized her so strongly that I was spending my life fighting her. Then I went back and I rewrote the whole thing. Everything that I had written up until then then that had to be written in the light of this piece of knowledge. And that's the way it works. It takes a long time sometimes to know what you're actually writing about. And then once you know, everything, everything uh, gets written with that in, in mind. Did your mother read these She did. <laughs> what did she say to you? She did everything. She raged. <laughs> she, she, uh, she, she... First, she said it was wonderful I'd spoken the truth, and she didn't realize how much she meant to me. Then, you know, two weeks later, she called me up and said, now you've held me up to ridicule. The whole world knows you hate me. Yeah. And then after a while, she got into the celebrity of the book, and she walked around New York signing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Ma, you can't do that. You know, you didn't write the book. <laughs> she said, well, without me, you don't have a book. <laughs> she had a point. Yeah. She didn't really, uh, she would understand, it wasn't that she couldn't understand, she was very intelligent, but she was incredibly self-defended, so 
she, you know, she was volatile and childlike, and uh, you couldn't depend upon her. And that was the point. I decided finally, this is my story. This is my truth. And I knew that I was not writing to trash her. I knew that, that, and that was my grail, my holy grail. That's what I held on to. That I knew I was, I was writing as honestly as I could about this fierce attachment. That I was never going to um, aggrandize myself at her expense. Um, and that I worked hard to really rigorously never do that. You know, there were plenty of times when I would have wanted to. But I, I took that as, a, as, as my uh, mission. So I, I felt justified in doing everything I did. And then she would make me quail. And, and she'd say, why are you writing this book? And, and I wouldn't be able to write for three days. And then I'd forget about her because wasn't, she wasn't going to intimidate me. I wanted too badly to write the book. <laughs> and that's actually the truth for everyone who writes this, this kind of thing. And even more, you know, you know, the truth is more novelists get sued by their parents than memoirists. Yeah, because more, more, yeah, mm. more novelists feel free to hold their parents up to ridicule by pretending <laughs> they're writing about somebody else, and the parents really see it. Yeah, it was astonishing to me to discover that, yes. because the lawyers for the for the publisher uh, of Fierce Attachments, they questioned me rigorously with the with actually what they were really asking is, do you think your mother's going to sue? And I knew she would never do anything like that, you know. And, and I, and then I went through the book in my own mind. I thought, am I holding her up to ridicule? No, I wasn't. You know, that's so interesting because uh, sometimes when I'm talking to my students about, you know, family stories they want to write, and they say, I just, I can't, I can't write this because right. my parents are still alive. And I say, well, you could consider writing it as fiction. I'm going to stop saying that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't tell them that. <laughs> well, I suppose it makes sense because the process of writing that. Um, personal narrative is also about a process of self-awareness, isn't of it? Yes, yeah. of course. And when you fr- you think, oh, I'm free of that, I'm just going to do it in fiction. Right. Mm, lawyers, <laughs> yeah. I'm knocking. Right, yeah. Yeah, the question is motivation. It's yeah. not, you know, yeah. th- these uh, these labels that you pin on a figure uh, like a, on a doll. Uh, it's motivation. It's it's really what is it you are really trying to to write about here? What are you accomplishing? And interrogating yourself about your motives mm, constantly. Throughout. Yeah, <laughs> and you had a bit of that too, didn't you? I know you had to make decisions, ethical decisions, about changing people's names, or mm. um, and I never identify anybody. Yeah. Never. I, mean, I couldn't write because uh, because I do feel I'm composing that, and, and that um, if I want to put words in a character's mouth whom I feel I know well, and I have the right to make this piece of the narrative move by doing that i i can't do it if i'm using a real name yeah and yeah. composite characters sometimes sometimes yeah. not too often but yeah. sometimes yeah yeah. yeah so i uh made the decision to change the names of all the friends uh, uh-huh. that i wrote about right in the book i left my immediate family's names the same just because it would have been silly given that people know my name to change right. you know, the name of my sister who has the same, same neck, second name mm-hmm. um, and my mother's well known person so you know and uh, but I that was easy because I wrote about them with great love right, and respect uh, by and large and I showed my immediate family, the people whose names I didn't change, I showed them a draft of the memoir the before part. I sent it to a publisher oh. and got their, their blessing for it. Oh great. But I wrote, I changed the names of friends and my former partner, um, and uh, the problem with changing the name of my former partner was that he's quite a well-known public figure, and anybody could do one quick Google search and find out who he was. So in a sense, it was a token gesture, but it was well, a gesture that a was important gesture. to me yeah. because... And to him, a, I'm I sure. wanted him to be on a same, you know, on a level playing field with all of the other right. people, relationships in my life. Um, and B, I didn't want this book to be perceived as a memoir about a famous person. Right. Which is the like common. A a, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. A kiss and yeah. tell, so. Kiss and tell. You know, about this famous uh-huh. person. Uh, and look. What's he you, famous for? 
um, <clears throat> he's a famous musician. Oh. Uh, and look, you know, that th- was a damned if you do, damned if you don't yes, situation, I'm really. Sure. I was criticised for changing his name and told I was being coy. Um, I, on the other wow. hand, you know, if I had put his name in there, people would have said, you know, you just wanted to yeah. use this. In fact, I was also criticised for, for using him as a way to sell my story. Oh, my but, God. Uh, the reason that that, that that person had to be in this story, in fact, this person became part of the story in my situation, to use your terminology, yeah. is because just at the point in the narrative where I had had the epiphany that the essence of social anxiety is a fear of rejection, this person rejected me. Oh, no kidding. And the relationship of 10 years disappeared. And I was thrown into the midst of the shy persons, the socially anxious persons' yeah. worst possible fear, and right. I had to, had and to you find came ways out, to deal with that. But you came out the other side, I take it. I came out the other side, and, and I, and, you know, it, it, gave, it told me what was at stake, you know, because the other really useful uh, notion for all memoir writers is to think about what is at stake Mm -hmm. in the writing of this memoir and that showed me in the grimmest possible terms what was at stake for me in tackling this aspect of my life and my identity and writing about it in a book was how was I going to yeah survive this thing uh, and come through to the other end in order to be able to kind of write about it and finish this story so that I was it, telling. Did it shed that situation? Did it shed light on uh, your definition or understanding of shyness? Well, Is that it how proved, you used it? it proved this theory that I had, you know, come across or come to that the essence of social anxiety is fear of rejection. It showed me that this had been the big bogeyman my whole life, right? And that I had assiduously tried to avoid. The possibility of rejection, uh, but it also showed me that I could su- I could survive it, Indeed. and and that I could find kind of uh, a level of um, inner strength or you know grit uh, to to deal with this acute anxiety and uh, wait for it to pass. So. Uh, and you know, I suppose that's then the message that's embedded in in the book is that for other shy people reading this book looking for solutions or strategies to deal with their shyness, I suppose part of the message is you'll be amazed at what you find you can tolerate if you just let yourself be put in situations where you have to tolerate this mm-hmm. anxiety. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then, of course, you had to find a way to write about it that felt both truthful but also ethically... Yes. Um, that you could live with ethically. Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I said before that I gave a copy of, of my mem- draft memoir to my family to read before it was published. I didn't give a copy of my draft memoir to, to my former partner. partner to read. But I was, I did try very hard to be as honest as possible, even to the extent where I would write about a memory that I had and then I would think, is that really what it was like? And then I would scrabble around in my mm-hmm. box of old diaries, find the diary covering that, that time, period. 30 years ago, read it, discover a whole other version of those events, oh. and then put that in the memoir oh. as well. And then, But use the contrast between what I had remembered and yet what I had written at the time as another way of investigating and explaining my own temperament you know that I had written, good. I'd written that you know a scene where I was yeah. just terribly sad and anxious and lonely and nobody was talking to me and then in my diary it was like you know we went to the beach and I had this friend <laughs> I had that friend so then the question becomes why does memory privilege right. certain aspects of right. our identity yeah. and f- leave well, other bits mystery. on the cutting room right. floor yes what does that tell that's us about right. ourselves have you got an answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I do think that uh, memories, uh, memories attach to memories attach fiercely to emotions. Oh sure. And the emotions that I felt in those moments in my my youth when I was feeling most acutely stricken by social anxiety are the moments that I've recalled. All the happy moments just drifted right. off in the right. wake you yeah. know right. the memory right. wake <laughs> right uh, That's but also because the story I had come to tell was a story about shyness those are the 
you know, the search those and retrieve function yeah. of my memory had found those sure. things. Sure, yeah. Sounds good. Well, what did your partner, how did he respond to I you? have no idea. Oh, really? Oh, you don't even know if he read it? No. Oh. Oh. There's no contact. And we'll just leave is this like new? That. This has just been published? <laughs> two years. Two years oh, ago. Yeah. Two yeah. years ago. Yeah. And one of the things about, you know, you mentioned about using the, the diaries. Yes. Um, in terms of form, you use diaries, you interview yourself, you interview your mother in her with her psychiatrist, psychologist hat on, um, you blend research into it, you even write lists, you play with how things look on the page. Shy people love writing lists, so Sean. Oh, is that right? Constantly writing lists. Anxious people. Anxious people, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yes. Um, Anxiety will make you write lists, mm. yeah. What did all of that form, those different kinds of, different forms, allow you to do? Mm. Uh, They allowed me to do a few things. They allowed me to be very playful, which uh, was a reflection of part of who I am. Uh, so that was important if mm-hmm. I'm writing a memoir. And it's also a way of reassuring your reader that you're okay, which I think uh-huh. is important as well. To right. um, Even though you're writing about potentially very distressing things, I think it's good to kind of use humour as a way of uh, yeah, reassuring your reader that, guys, it's going to be okay in the end. Um, but also, yeah, as I said before, she, for example, lists uh, uh, are things that I use as an anxious person to calm myself to, to, to deal with my anxiety so in a way I was trying to use form to reflect temperament to reflect the subject matter to reflect the story that I was trying to tell um, the interviewing of people you know I'm a journalist well this is what I do I ask people questions I find out the answers let's put it in as a journalistic exercise um, I, yeah I even interviewed myself I have Shai Shan interviewing professional Sean. Two, <laughs> two different voices. Two different voices, yeah, because we are different people, aren't we? You know, depending indeed. on our, our, our situations. Indeed, indeed. But Vivian, you construct an, a narrator's voice that is quite consistent across your yeah, different what, books. How would you describe that that version of yourself? How would you describe that woman? I, I, I can't really describe her. Um, I've written about... Um, the pleasure I've taken in discovering her, uh, I don't really know how how to explain uh, the particular tone that I achieve through the narrator that I uh, that I um, not invent but develop. I know I know she's not me in the course of daily life, uh, but she is me in the sense that she's me. You know. Um, and I don't really, I just can't, I can't uh, investigate it any more than I have, which is t- just to say that I know when, I, when I'm writing that I'm pulling from myself somebody or something, a persona that feels right for telling the story that needs to be told. And once that tone of voice is achieved, then everything gets, uh, one thing I do know for sure, then everything uh, is becomes subordinate to it that I don't write anything that that tone of voice wouldn't say but I I really don't know how else to describe it but it's there it's the, definitely there it's a clear voice I hope so and yeah it, it, um, I set a great deal a great store by being lucid I do yeah one of the things I like about that voice is you do get that sense over several books of it coming out of that history coming out of that background of those two women forming it and the, oh, that the life good. and the, <laughs> well that that also that combination which you document of the the working class background plus then education plus then a career a mm. life of writing and a life in this city and i like how a lot a lot of your work is actually about movement around the city yes walking around the city talking to people interacting with people um, you've both written about movement recently in, in different ways. You're sort of like within the city, within one city. Yes. The greatest city in the mm-hmm. city. Shan's written recently about escaping from cities. She's got mm-hmm. this fantastic little camper van. Oh, and you do? She drives down the coast. <laughs> you do? I do. <laughs> By yourself or yeah. with friends? By mm-hmm. yourself. So is it, is this movement? And what do you do? You settle in those places and you write about that? 
Um, look, it depends. Yeah, I, I, I've started doing things like trying to escape from Melbourne's winter entirely by oh. getting in this van and just going north to warmer parts. Oh, and yes, writing about that. Um, but I also just, you know, get in the van on the weekends and and go down the coast to the beach or you know go bush. Uh, and you know, it's what everyone seeks when they uh, try to escape cities. It's it's uh, the pleasures of nature uh-huh. and right. fresh air and avoiding responsibility. <laughs> and lying so it is down. about escaping the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your narratives are often about escaping within the city. I don't think they were about escaping. Okay. <laughs> On the contrary, I uh, m- my encounters are made in order to connect. Um, so I um, mean, every encounter that I make in the book and in reality, it gives me an intense, the intense pleasure of feeling I've connected with an, another human being, and that we all in this city feel this, or many, many. That accounts for street theater, which is common in New York, and uh, and the recognition that that everyone who's involved in it wants and needs it. So there's no escaping. Well, there is escaping solitude. There is escaping well, the desk. There is compensation. Yeah. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah. It's compensation <laughs> for the solitariness, for the for the deleteriousness of solid of the solitary state. Yes, it's, it's making up for things. <laughs> it's interesting because I feel less alone and less solitary when I get in my van by myself and go down the coast mm-hmm. than I do sitting at my writer's desk in my busy inner suburban yeah. neighbourhood surrounded by this busy, busy cultural city. Yeah. Uh, there's something about a, a lack of obligation to be social when you're out of yeah. the city that uh, maybe it's about it's a shy yeah. thing. You know, the socially anxious persons need to just get right. away from people. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, we are all of these things, and as a writer, all you can do is take the raw material that is you, mm. your life, mm. and make the best of it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I understand that perfectly. And, and that kind of, for me, that kind of solitude, which is a solitude which requires no social engagement and requires no professional engagement, gives me time to think. Mm-hmm. And when I'm lying in the back of my little van, mm. watching the ocean... I am suddenly inundated with story ideas. Uh-huh. And I end up, you know, writing them down, all down on my phone and thinking, when I get back to town, I must write a column about that or I must write that short story. So, Do you uh, write a column? I, I, I write irregular columns. I have written regular columns in the past, but I, now, but I do love the personal column form as a way of writing, yes. So what sort of... Oh, so you can write about anything you want. Mm. Yeah. What are you working on now? What's next for you? <sighs> I want to write another memoir, uh, but it is uh, in similarly potentially painful emotional territory, so I'm procrastinating madly by writing a lot of personal comments (laughs) (laughs) and getting in the van and sitting at the desk. So to be honest, I'm considering moving town, moving cities for a year, to go to a place where I don't know people, I don't know many people, I'm not offered work, so I have nothing to do but confront that screen and actually get this stuff down and you get always it always try New York, I hear it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think somewhere... She doesn't sound like at home. New York will do I it have, for her. You know, I have parents who I need to be within cooey of because they're ageing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, if, if I go somewhere where it's an hour-long flight back to my mum and dad, then that would be great. But, uh, you know, this is the trouble with memoirs sometimes, isn't it? It requires what? you to dig, you know, dig your entrails out. And that can be a, a bit aversive to, to consider doing that again. <laughs> Indeed. And Vivian, are you working on a new... Uh, I, I, I am, but it's it's uh, nothing like this. Uh, I, I am actually about to start writing a book of rereadings. I'm going to reread books that mattered a great deal to me when I was young, and write about how they look now. <laughs> that I think will give me a lot of pleasure. It will. It gives all a lot of pre- mm-hmm. pleasure. I'm sure. <laughs> Is there any writing by women that you've enjoyed reading recently? 
No, you know, I'm really bad about contemporary writing. I, I, I hardly ever read any unless I'm paid to or um, something stunning has, uh, has uh, come up. Um, so I don't think so. But I have just written a long essay on the work of Elizabeth Bowen, mm-hmm. who a great English writer who has sort of fallen into um, obscurity. Uh, whom I reread just recently and and was thrilled to discover how to rediscover how great she is. So that's been my my woman <laughs> my woman writer's work uh, recently. Yeah, she is. I she is a great that. great writer. One of that great and off many of them forgotten or neglected. Yes. Now, yeah. Post war. Yeah. Yes. Women writers. She is, somewhere. which is surprising, but yeah. but she is. And Sean, any. Uh, Any great yes. writing by women you've been reading? Yes, about. yes. <clears throat> Charlotte Wood, Australian writer Charlotte Wood's uh, The Natural Way of Things, uh, the novel which has been nominated for just about every uh, prize in the country at the oh, moment and right? already winning some of them, and for very good reason. Uh, I think it's astonishing. I think it's. Is it a novel? It's a novel. Uh, the Natural Way of the Things? The Natural Way of Is Things. Is she an Australian? She's an Australian. She's a Sydney based writer. And it's a, a, a feminist text I would you know label it as such and it is so timely because it it examines the dark heart of violent misogyny uh, which is all around us under just underneath the surface of our apparently civilized society mm-hmm. you know uh, there is more women killed by men already this year than for a very long time in this country and uh, we are having royal commissions into domestic violence and violence against women. Uh, Women are being trolled to death online and this book absolutely, you know, within one small sort of scene that she describes over a period of time gets absolutely to the heart of that terrible thing that that must be dealt with. So it's amazing. Mm. So read that. I'm I'm going to read read that. that. The Natural Way of Things. So, Sean Pryor, so. Vivian Gornick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. part of the Unladylike podcast. Sean Pryor's book, Shy, a memoir, is published by Text. Vivian Gornick's The Odd Woman in the City is published by Nero Books in Australia and Farrah, Strauss and Giroux in the US. Thank you for listening to Unladylike. You can find more episodes at unladylikepodcast.com on iTunes or Audio Boom. We talk more about women in writing on Twitter and Facebook, so come and chat to us there.